Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective perspective. <laughs> what I wanted to start this with was my dog died exactly a week ago. I've had this fucking dog since I was seven years old. Wow. Yeah. Lasted all the way till almost my 24th birthday. So, how does that make you feel? Like, why did you want that to be your first topic? I don't know. It's just weird. I think she's worth remembering, mm-hmm. but memorable dog i did the math on it and i spent like two years of my life laying next to this dog like not just two years of like sleeping time like i think i spent about six years of sleeping with her like every night right and then spend a third of our life sleeping yeah i had a dog die actually pretty like i guess violently to say the least oh wow and i had him for six years and that was a tough loss that's that was just as bad as losing a relative or anything and i think because with an animal you spend so much time with them your grandma obviously you you spend time with but not like a dog where you see every day and whatnot so it hits so hard i'm not saying a relative doesn't but i understand that that's tough so are you um like the emotional aspect of it how how are you dealing with it or oh i'm completely fine it's been a really she was like 18 like right so i thought she was gonna die like four years ago so it was it was really like it, that, for example, that sounds very sudden. Mm-hmm. If you had it for six years and then out of nowhere, however, it passed away, like, and if it was violent too, it's like, damn, like, that's a lot I harder to cope with. Another dog. Really? Yeah. Another dog killed another your dog. dog. Big old German Shepherd uh, ate my little Jack Russell. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Wait, but literally I, ate it? Or Yeah, so I had a party at my house and. I was outside with one of my buddies cleaning up all the beer cans that were in the yard, and we had the gate open, and my dog loves getting out and just running, just goes. Like, was his favorite thing to do was to try to escape until we could find him. Always came back, though, right? So anyways, we're outside cleaning up beer cans. My dog gets out, and I'm like, God damn it. Anyways, it's not a big deal because he always comes back. Huge storm rolls in, right? And he's out in the woods, and this storm is just deadly like mm-hmm. pouring rain lightning everything and i'm like dude this is not good like no way he's gonna be able to find his way back because scents get thrown off and stuff anyway so i'm freaking is out that how dogs point. get back they, like scent, they navigate I by scent sure. really i think that's definitely a big thing wow that's impressive i never yeah. knew that i mean i don't say you'd have to because i don't think that they've been out enough to know like where the house is so scent, mm-hmm. yeah and th- how many freaking i don't even know what it's called but like uh, receptors in their nose they have is like unbelievable so, like, picking up a scent is not a big deal at all. Anyways, so I knew it was bad because the rain came in. So I go out, and I'm looking for my dog for, like, an hour or two through the woods, just trekking. I'm muddy. I'm wet. I'm like, oh, this is not good. But I was staying positive, right? Optimism, huge thing. Anyways, I finally called my, my mom, and I'm like, hey, Oliver got out. I'm like, he's not coming back. And she's like, all right, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Whole day goes by. Never happened before. At this point, it's panic. It's me, my mom, my sister, my dad. We all made flyers, put them all over the area, all mm-hmm. over nothing for another day finally we get a call two days later and it's like hey i found your dog um i had to take him to the vet because my dog actually ended up attacking him and my dog is not vicious at all like you come up to him he rolls over on his back and wants to get played and that's what happened so this dog came over and like mauled him from like his waist and just yeah so and then he was still alive though so that's why she took him to the vet but they had to put him down because there was no saving him so it was just terrible. You think that's what happened? Like he he kind of almost submitted. It I was think like so. like being playful. Not playful, just nervous. It was nervous, playful, anything. He would like you said would submit and just roll right to his back and just be like, "Don't hurt me or tickle me." Uh-huh. And that's what I'm saying because apparently his stomach was just like obliterated, which I mean it sucks, but I almost that's don't very m- unheard of. Yeah. Like for another dog to be that violent, that just doesn't sound like. I don't know. Like I, yeah, I, I can't stand hearing stories like that, that a dog could do that, or you've raised a dog or not raised the dog properly to attack something else that isn't trying to, like, be dominant. Because, like, yeah, I know wolves will do that. Like, they'll they'll fight, and then the other one will roll and expose its neck to the other, and it's like a dominance act. Right. And then the, like, almost wolf etiquette mm-hmm. is to let the other wolf live. And that's, that's – uh, and then they, they walk away, and, like, one's, like, considered, like, more dominant, and then the other one. Right. But they, they figured that out through, like, physical yeah, altercation. Yeah, well, that wasn't the case. But, anyway, so the saddest part, so obviously that's all sad. Anyway, so we went and picked, uh, his name's Oliver, up 
put them in, wrap them up in a blanket, and like I, it wasn't a shoe box, but it was some sort of box because we buried them at my house. But we had to show my other dog, and they're like best friends. Like, sorry, like your brother just died. So we opened the box and let my other dog come up and like understand like what had happened with death, and that was so sad seeing my other dog like go up and trying to be like, hey, like why aren't you moving? So that do you think was, dogs can conceptualize the fact of death? Like their own mortality, but I, I maybe not their own mortality because that's like a self awareness thing. But are they able to conceptualize that another dog is passed or that their their owner is passed? I'm sure we could find a lot of research behind that. Personally, I don't know. If I had to make an assumption, yeah, I think so. You think your dog could tell? Like just that specific instance? You yeah, thought? Yeah, I've seen. I mean, mother dogs. Like I saw a video on Facebook the other day where uh, it was like an earthquake. And this dog had puppies, and all of his puppies were under all the rubble. And he went and got somebody, or the mom went and got somebody, and was, like, right here and was, like, digging until the humans, like, went over there and, like, got all their puppies out. So, instinctively, yeah, they they have instincts like any other, I think, living creature. Mm -hmm. I'd say yeah. I don't know. I'd say yeah, but I don't know enough about it to, like, make a logical. I would guess yes as well. Mm -hmm. That's funny you say that, though, because um – they're not funny, but it's <laughs> ironic you say that because on Saturday it was parents' weekend. My parents came into town. We would go out to the bars, and on my way home, I'm a little drunk, and I'm uh, I'm with my other dog, like the one that's still alive. And I don't even remember saying this, but my friend was making fun of me for it because I was saying oh, it. No. And I was like, have you conceptualized the fact that Snickers is dead? And I, But I was, like, genuinely curious. Like, I'm curious if my dog has any clue that Wait, my other dog. your parents that? No, no, dog. I was asking my dog, oh. like sarcastically, like a little drunk, a little, little tipsy. And <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. And I think what's crazy today in society is that, like, the compassion for death is just starting to be, like, non-existent. Unless death happens, so, like, it was your dog, so you mourn that so much greater. But you tell your friend that, it's like, oh, okay. But I feel like just 10 years ago, it was like, oh, my gosh, someone died in your family. Like, I'm coming to your funeral. I'm doing this. Like, you need time. I'm there for you. But today in society, there's so much death and mass shootings, and, like, it just flies over everyone's head. Like, oh, it didn't happen here. And I just think the mourning process, everything about death is getting so much less serious. And oh, I think shit. it's just taking us to a worse place if, to, to personally. Maybe even Call of Duty because you're dying eight times. You're killing other people. I don't know. Call of Duty's been out long enough or I wouldn't attribute it to that. I don't think violence comes from video games necessarily. But like I said, I don't know enough. If if it did, I feel like I would have robbed a few cars. Maybe uh, got a grenade launcher at some point just because I could. If I could figure it out, I maybe would have. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah, I agree. I don't think I... I don't feel like Grand Theft Auto, for example, is like a release for me or I, I even want to. But I can see how it could be. Possibly if you sure. got that crazy side too. And if you're angry at the world. And I think it's a lot easier to be angry at the world today. A lot of people got some problems. And I think it stems a lot from media, for sure. And I think Hollywood's the biggest thing. Like, L.A., California, they control so much. Every single person hates Trump, it, like, it seems like. But it's like it all comes from California. Like, everything you see, Facebook, Instagram, like, they're all – they control everything over there. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to formulate your own opinions. That's why I'm so big into doing, like, my own research on anything and everything. And if someone asks me something that I don't know about, hence do dogs um, – would you ask me if the dogs know? Do like de if can they conceptualize, conceptualize the fact of death? Right. And I can make my own opinion, but I don't know, and I'm not going to tell you that, yeah, they can – because I want to like would want to form my own um, opinions by doing my research, mm -hmm. and I don't think people do that. I really don't. Just because. Do you think people speculate? Because whenever I ask you that, I wasn't ask I wasn't necessarily asking for like a definitive, mm -hmm. like the analytics or the the data has sh proven that dogs can understand the fact that there there's death because we have been proven to show that dogs are coping with the death of a loved mm -hmm. one or whatever. It was more like speculating, but well, yeah. do you think people speculate as well? Well, yeah. Or do you yeah. think they just kind of mindlessly take in information and then take that as fact and don't really do their own research? I think it depends. I think it's a lot easier to not do your own research and stuff because if you've ever heard something, it's already right here in the back of your head where you can be like, oh, I heard about that. This is what I know. 
Instead, oh, I, d I have heard about that, but I don't know enough about it. Let me do research. I think the easier to think is, yes, I do know something about that. Just spit it out there. Mm -hmm. I think the harder thing to do is to listen and then do your research and then talk. Because it takes more time. No one wants to take more it's time. It's a form of thinking. Like, you actually got to think on it. Right. It's definitely a lot more... Uh, it's, a, it's a lot more of a... I don't know. Like, actually to process that and intellectualize it and consider it from other points of view because mm -hmm. that's what you're doing whenever you're doing research you're forming an opinion which is a form of thinking right right yeah perspectives there's just i mean that's what i mean i'm a communication major here so i learned so much about it and i really enjoy like in those classes because i feel like i excel because i understand and i feel like a lot of things missing today is no matter what everyone has a different perspective no matter what so you got to understand that you're not always gonna um, be the exact same as someone else and, and that's why you got to be optimistic about stuff and just if someone says something you don't agree with you got to put yourself in their shoes like I said perspective wise and be like oh that's why they're saying it because too many people clash over too much stuff and there's too much hate and too much evil and it's just it really gets to people and I think that's why it's almost like a more depressing society to live in nowadays because people just don't get along mm -hmm. point blank they just don't this is kind of rooted in ignorance, but I'm very optimistic that that is like there's going to be a collective shift in the population, at least in like civilized, the more civilized world, more modern world, that people will have more of an objective point of view and be able to consider other points of view. I, I so you see think it's that go positive. I think, think it, it's going to end up going positive. It's almost like it has to go down before it goes up. Right. And I because think it has to at this point. Like you said, it has to go positive. Because at this point, I mean, and this could just be my perspective, but I think a lot more shit in today's society is negative. But it, it, it almost seems like it, like how you talk to people and like it, listen to other people, it, everything's a little bit more depressing. Until Thursday nights when we get to drink and go out, then it's mm -hmm. like, hoo-hoo. But every other day, it's like, shit. So, yeah, I think everything has to get more positive for uh, us to thrive and I think the United States is such a powerhouse of everything and everyone watches what we do and stuff and if we just continue to be negative and all this and all other countries are going to start um, catching up with us and I, that, that's the world demise type stuff and I don't want to get too like into it because I don't know mm -hmm. but I think in the next 50 years when we're older we're going to see some stuff and I hope it's positive I hope we can backtrack and start like accepting and enjoying life because I mean what you got a hundred years on this planet right Theoretically, you got a hundred years. You got to be able to live that, and and I just don't think people are anymore. We're just too worried. We're too mean. Do you think people are? Uh, do you think the media has more of an incentive to cover more negative topics, or at least alter the public yeah. opinion in a negative way? Well, in comparison a, to like a positive perception. Uh, I don't know. I think people are drawn to both negative and positive. Because there's videos out there of babies walking for the first time that gets millions of views. But if you go on Facebook and you see someone getting beheaded, it's got 10 million views. Like, for whatever reason, people are interested in, like, the, the weird part of society and stuff. And Is it fucked up that, that I would watch both of those videos? Like, I would definitely watch both of those videos. No, so would I. It's not, but the media knows, like... I mean, it's demographic-wise, and, like, they do they do all the research and the analytics behind everything, and they see, okay, what gets the most um, search results, what's do this. So that's what they put out there because that's money. Views are money, and that's what it is. And I like money, too, but not to the expense of, like, hurting our society, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think the people in power don't have uh, enough, I guess, compassion for the human race. I was listening to a, a podcast the other day, and there were five major emotions that – make things kind of go viral it was empathy awe surprise maybe happiness mm -hmm. and th there's one other but i can't remember it at this point those are all fairly positive i mean surprise could be either way but the wild thing is like most of the media coverage is with some negative agenda right at and least I it seems that way i mean if you just watch the news i mean that shit is pretty depressing a lot of people, like, I know a lot of people say they don't watch the news because they don't want to be depressed. I don't know. But if you don't watch the news, you don't really know what's going on. But, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can live your life. But I think 
the ultimate thing is to live it that makes you the happiest and I don't mm-hmm. think a lot of people are so you've got to kind of figure that figure that out yeah I feel like something for me that's been a big positive impact since college is just like trying a f- being very open minded to a fuck ton of new hobbies cause at least like, right. like honestly like this this whole hedonistic culture and of college of like going out drinking all the time and and uh, I don't know, not that not that all the relationships are superficial, but somewhat superficial interactions. Some are pretty genuine as well. And I don't know, it's just hedonism. It's just pleasure, 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 pleasure. Right. And honestly, to kind of escape taking on the pain, if you want to call it pain, of like taking on that responsibility throughout the day. It's like an escape. And honestly, I'm just kind of over it at this point in college. And I'm really, really excited to get out of here and kind of pursue other things and the alternative for me has been hobbies honestly just trying things that give your life like some purpose and give you like goals that you can set like tangible results that you see yourself getting better at just that progress i respect that 100 percent because that's what i like that's why i'm here right now you try to get me here a few weeks ago and it's like oh i'm a little skeptical like i could go and do that but i could go and work out it's like yeah i'm gonna hold off but it's like i want to broaden like my life in general and i want to try new things and I'm having a blast right now i really am i think it's hell yeah awesome. hell yeah intellectual wise and like getting to know you even better and just like different personalities of people it's my favorite it's way awesome. to connect with people right here honestly yes, i think it's amazing but talking to people like face to face like our cell phones are not anything like that like yeah that's how you understand and like that's how it was back in the day you know you didn't have like what we have now but getting back on that topic i kind of live with people in my like little circle of people they're confined to like what they like they like one thing and they stick with it and i'm like you, I, okay i understand you like that one thing mm-hmm. try something else why because if you just do one thing you're gonna end up not liking that thing potentially or it's just like that's such a simple-minded way of life and life is so much greater than that so just doing a bunch of different things not only if even if you hate it you're gonna gain experience from it and then if you it's end like up you have to it, give up this other thing no. you know like i i tried i podcasting for example i tried podcasting i still play soccer a fuck ton right i still love soccer just as much and sometimes it comes with the opportunity cost of not being able to play soccer as much as i would want but i enjoy i enjoy soccer more because it's more like sacred it's more right it's like this is i get to do it whenever i get to do it it's like hell yeah i get to go do soccer and i I feel like it's more of a balance of hobbies Mm -hmm. so whenever i have some free time it's like i have hobby a hobby b hobby c hobby d and that's and awesome because you always have something to do. And like, if it's raining out, you got podcasting, for example. Like, the people I'm around don't. If like, if something goes wrong and they can't do something, then they're just like depressed in bed all day. And it's like it's tough. And like, oh, you're gonna do a podcast? You're weirdo with who? Who is this guy? It's like someone that I know. Like, get out of your comfort zone. Like, do things. Uh-huh. Like, and I try to preach this, and and I don't know. I think that everyone has to go through something dramatic in their life to really like open up and like get different of view and i don't think my friends have really gone through like something dramatic enough to change them Mm -hmm. and yeah they're just pretty complacent so i'm trying and i'm optimistic though because i know because i've went through shit in my life and it's like all right like there's more to it so whenever you were kind of speculating on this um, like what this would be when you're sitting down putting on the headphones and whatnot like it's new was it was there like some sense of like discomfort like or like feeling like uneasy about it you're like oh shit i don't i've never done this i don't know so kind of yes but i've gotten so much better at like being comfortable in situations because i tell myself it's an experience if it goes bad you're gonna learn something like i just said and if it goes good you're gonna love it that's what i tell myself going into stuff and it takes half my nerves and just throws them out the window so now i'm hardly nervous when I was over here, like, when I was driving here, I was like, all right, a little nervous, play some music, I'm cool. Because I've never done something like this. New yeah, experiences totally. are obviously scary. And then we start talking upstairs, I get more comfortable, come down here. No, and I was completely comfortable. But I've trained myself to do that. For other people, they back out of stuff because they get so nervous. And for, for example, there was a show called uh, Party Cove. MTV was going to... Make is that the thing at Lake of the Ozarks? Right, and I don't even know if it ever aired or anything like that. I remember a ton of people were trying out for that. Right, so like in my small little niche place back home, one of my friends heard about it and sent it to me over Facebook, right? And I was like, you know what, this is sick, because I love MTV, I love reality TV, like it's my, I love it. So I applied for it, I sent in like a raunchy ass story that I had from down here, which is crazy, we could potentially talk about <laughs> that. Anyway, so the girl writes me back, one of the interviews, she's like, I loved your story, you gotta come in, and I was like, 
hell yeah, this is so sick. Didn't tell anybody about it. I was so nervous. So on the day that I was supposed to go interview, I got up in the morning. I was like, no, I'm definitely not going. Fuck that. And I just sat there. And then I just kept thinking. I was like, dude, I got to get out there and do things. So I got all dressed, got ready, drove to the gas station, grabbed two tall boys, pounded one. And then I was like, all right, nerves are kind of out. Drove downtown, got there, pounded my other tall boy, walked to like Hotel Magnolia or something into this big conference room. And I was like, oh, no. (laughs) What did I get myself into? Cameras, lights everywhere. And I was like, (laughs) <laughs> but I was like, I was already there, and, and I did it, and I did the whole experience. I did I did pretty well, and uh, after it was done, I was like, yes, I can say that I just did something, and I learned so much from it, and, like, I'm just that much better off than the next person that wouldn't go out of their way and do something, and and I just think people got to get out there and do stuff. I love how you pounded the tall boys right oh, before. Oh, had to. I, I had love to take that. a little edge off. But yeah, now calm the nerves like, a little bit. Yeah, Why not? But right? you still did it. You did it. The end result is you did it. Right. But that's, that's been my experience. Like, literally everything you just mentioned, the the event, the shittiest part is everything leading up to it. The nerves before leading up to it. And then you get into it and you're like, I'm just existing at this point in time with other people and doing my yes, thing. You got to look at it from them. They're here. They're just interviewing you. Like, they're going to see 100 other people. They don't really care. It's like presenting in school. Everyone's got to do it. And, like, that's kind of – it starts lessening your nerves. And when you get up there, some people listen to you. Some people don't. Like, you just got to do it. And it's nerve-wracking. But once you get through it, you feel so good. So Absolutely. You got to pick as many positives out of everything negative. And it makes – I think it makes the whole experience better. I struggle with school, with presenting in school. And I think it's mainly because it's not my authentic self. I think it's two things. I think it's right. me from my childhood. I was a lot more shy when I was younger. Mm-hmm. So I was like – I don't know. It's something that that develops whenever I was a kid and just being in the school environment, people having power over me, power over my grade, and I'm being judged on how I'm performing. Right. And I think the other variable is it doesn't feel like me. It feels like this, like, act that I have to put on to get a good grade. And it is, but that's, like, any acting and stuff. So, like, certain companies want certain actors because they know their authentic self and they think that they're going to be good in this role. So with presentations, what I do is, yes, it's not 100% authentic. Like, I don't want to get up and present, but you got to make it as, as authentic as you can. And humor is a big thing to me. So any presentation I have, no matter how serious it has to be, I will slide humor in. Because if I, like I can that. slide that humor in, that's me. I love it. I love trying to be the funny guy, and I always do it. And uh, that's one way, I'd say, that makes that's me more smart. authentic. So anything that you think you are, if you can put that in your presentation – that, that's going to make you more comfortable, for sure. I like Cause that. Because it, it's kind of you. Uh, it bit me in the ass last year, though. Uh, we had a serious presentation for my advanced public speaking class, and I made it a little bit too funny. It was about um, tattooing and, like, the repercussions in today's society versus, um, like, 20 years ago and just a bunch of stuff. And it was supposed to be serious. And I just made it as funny as possible because I was uh-huh. like, I'm not going to stand up. It was, like, a 10-minute presentation. I was like, I'm not going to stand up here for 10 minutes and just be serious. I can't. I'll lose interest. I'll lose everyone else's interest. And it's statistically proven that if you put humor in a presentation, people will listen to you. And I did it. And that just I, makes sense. Right. That makes sense. Right. And I've never got a response from any other presentation like I did from that one. People were laughing, clapping after, telling me that that was literally so good. I got an F. My best presentation I think I've ever done. It was okay, though, because I got to self-critique myself and evaluate myself after. So I got her paper. This is what all you did wrong. And it, too much humor here, humor, humor, humor. And I was like... You fucking bitch. So anyways, on it, I went to her and I wrote, I wrote, I went and looked up and I said, statistically, it's proven that humor, blah, 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 all this. And I, and I ended up getting an A though. So you pulled it back up to an A. Yeah. From an F to a, no, 89. No, almost an A. Wow. But I, so I think she did it on purpose though. Cause dude, you've never, I was so fucking mad that I couldn't even talk. I just did this presentation. I got results from the audience. Like I've never seen. And I, so you thought you aced it. Yeah. I got a 58 dude. And I was like. I didn't even know what to say, so I just walked out. Because she graded it right in front of you. After you're done, uh-huh. she grades it right in front of your face. And, like, what you did wrong. But then she let you... You left the class? Uh, I was the last one to go. Okay, so, absolutely. Yeah, I was able to. But anyways, I got to self-critique it. And, yeah, I don't know what it was, but I ended up getting a B. So, I, I guess that's a, a portion of her class that I didn't understand. So, she wanted you to argue your case? Yes. It had to have been, because it made no sense. But she, I really don't think she liked it. Because she called me out on every funny thing. Like, I tried to implement uh-huh. so i don't know i don't like that teacher see see that's that's the part about school it's like you you get a bag a bad egg 
you know, you got some teachers that are able, just like any boss in life. Like you got some bosses that are going to be able to take a joke. Yeah. And I, I feel fine around the work environment, but around teachers, you're so dependent on that grade. Like you need, it's not like you want yeah. a good grade. It's like you need a good grade to pass the class. Yeah. But you, you, there's steps you can take to help yourself for sure. So teachers are people too. And like a lot in the communication department, they're understanding as hell. I don't know about business stuff because the business classes are so much bigger and so much Comms my like, minor, and they're a lot cooler in the yes, comm they department. Are. They're they a lot more understanding, a lot more willing to listen. Right. And the business can, the business professors are decent too, but I I noticed that like the comm professors are very different. Yeah, I think so one hundred percent. I vibe with that a lot better. I think they're more for the student than getting the good grades. So I don't. I know. like communications a lot. Honestly, I thought that was right. a really cool semester i pretty much finished my entire minor in one semester but it was it was a really really cool semester i thought right and i think it just gets such a bad rap oh you're a communication like i feel uncomfortable telling people that i am a communications major why because it's looked down upon like by a lot of people especially when i was younger too oh what are you doing i'm like oh communications oh like what are you gonna do in life you're gonna make no money always and so still to this day sometimes i like i had the, the point of courage where every time someone asked me which is like a normal thing to ask in college when you meet someone oh what do you do oh i'm a communication major and i was like fuck it i'm just gonna embrace it and then like the more times i heard other people saying it like it was like derogatory almost like oh my god you're this that i started telling people, people would actually say that yeah like oh my god I swear and so now i tell people i'm a marketing major some of the times because that's uh-huh. my minor they're like, oh, okay, cool. We're cool, flip flop. Cool. You and I are flip flop. Oh no shit. Yeah, yeah. Dude, that's a lot of it. Communication and marketing. Uh, I, they I go together. A lot, of, a lot of the same people in each class. So yeah, I just communication gets a bad rep, and I don't know why. I really don't. I personally, I don't, I don't know if you'd agree with this. I this is weird because I thought communications was a lot easier than the marketing classes, but I also think I learned more in those communication classes than I do in the marketing. So like that's so paradoxical. Like you think, oh, it, this is harder. Then you gotta, then you learn less. Right. Or um, if you, then you learn more if it's harder. But no, I think I think the business ones are a lot more difficult. But I mm-hmm. think the communication classes, I probably learn more in those classes than right. any college. Okay, so I think communication classes are pretty easy for the most part. But then again, like that's what I feel like I'm good at, so I excel at it. I think any of the business classes are so much more structured. With communications, yes. there's yes. so many avenues. There's so many theories you can take, and there you can put your own twist on stuff. And the teacher either understands it or is like, "Yeah, I, I understand it, or I get why." But it's kind of like any, an art. Yeah, that that kind of is, and and I think that's easier. But some people suck at that. Some people are numbers, and they know numbers, and they know math. I could, I can't fucking add 100 plus 300. Mm-hmm. Like, I fucking suck, but I can talk all day. It's 400. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So I understand, and. I get into arguments with my roommates sometimes because we're all talking and they're as old as I am, but they still got like a year or two years left. And I'm like, well, I'm graduating in May. And they're like, yeah, well, your classes are so fucking easy. And then I'm like, that would annoy me after a while. That that kind of, that's what hurts me. And I'm like, fuck, well, all right, I'm just going to say I'm a marketing major. Anyways, it's like, all right, well, do what I do. I guarantee I do it better than you. It might be easier and you might pass it, but I'm going to excel in it. I don't know. You still got two years, and I don't. I think those comm theories are really, really interesting and really applicable to your life. Very applicable. I mean, communication's everyone's forte. Like everyone has to communicate in some way. Even if you can't talk, you're deaf. You got to be able to communicate. Mm-hmm. You got to be able to communicate virtually as well. Like it's just a huge thing. And if you're not good at it, I don't know. And everyone thinks they're really good at it. And I mean, everyone's probably decent at communicating because we've been doing it our whole life. But like. I don't know. I just enjoy it. Really? You think people, like, everybody thinks they're good? Yeah. Oh, my God. Do you know I've never thought about that. I'd say so. Have you? So if you went up and asked some random person and you were like, do you think you're good at communicating? I'd say 98% of the time they'd say yes. No I've doubt. never thought about that. I'm, I'm going to ask somebody to boogie that tonight. Do I'm going to ask somebody that. Remind me to, but I'll do it. Deal. I'm just, do you think you're good at communicating? Yeah. Yeah. For sure, and that's why everyone, that's why it's such a bad rep, because everyone's like, I already have that shit mastered. Mm-hmm. I already have communication mastered. But if, they, if there's a whole uh, college of communications, like, you don't have it mastered. Like, there's these people with doctor's degrees that, like, I don't know. It, it's just a lot bigger than people um, say it is, I think, personally. It's of high importance. Yeah. Very high importance. Right. 
very applicable, very used every single fucking day of your life. I, I, my own analysis, that's really interesting because I'm, I've treated this experience like a sport Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to improve upon that. Right. Like something I do, and you may have noticed this is I, whenever I'm talking, I will, I have a really bad habit of looking away from like making eye contact. Yeah. Like that's something to work on. I say like a lot. I've gotten a lot better at that, but I'm trying to eliminate like, uh, and also whenever you're talking, I'm, I, I feel this need and I'm getting over this as well. But I feel this need to whenever you're talking to be like, uh huh, yeah. No, that's uh-huh. good though. Okay. And so I'm I'm getting better just fucking listening and like hearing you out. Yes. No, and that's not a bad thing. The uh huh, yes, that makes me know that you're listening and paying attention. Uh huh. That's like a. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's like that's a good thing. Head nodding, all of that, like um. I can't stand when I listen to someone present. I know it, I feel bad because, like, everyone's a little nervous. I can't fucking stand it. If you say like or um, that's the only thing I hear in my head, and I literally just, like, want to scratch my I eyes. start counting. I, yes, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. We had a recorder ourselves in one of my um, advanced public speaking classes, and I said um a lot more than I thought I did. I don't say like often, but I said um a lot more. And, uh, oh, that, that got to me. But, yeah, I can't stand that. But with the eye contact, too, eye contact is so, I guess, nerve-wracking. It really is. Because not breaking eye contact is kind of weird. And and that's why you got to every so often. So it's like, if I'm staring at you for a second and say, oh, it's getting a little different, you take a sip of your beer, but you're back to it. Because eye contact is a huge thing. If you don't have eye contact, it's kind of looked at as deceitful, right? Like, mm, is he being truthful? Not right? engaged. Look at me, right, not engaged. You might not be listening. And that's good things to learn because, I mean, in interviews and stuff and, like, all right, you're a math major, go get this job. But it's different because if you're really good at, like, math and whatnot, you're going to get your job. Like, it mm-hmm. doesn't matter how bad your interview skills are or anything like that. But with communication degrees, so that's selling and stuff, I don't know. I don't know what, have the, what the real world has to offer. Like, I don't know what my big boy job is yet, and I don't know what interview process I'm going to have to go through or anything. But hopefully I'm prepared enough to have a good enough uh, pitch. I think you'll do well. I think you'll do well. And I I would agree. I think the communication classes help me with that. Mm -hmm. Being able to, like, get to it with confidence and and seem like a straightforward, decent person. I mean, my buddies that are in the uh, college of business, I tell them, I'm like, yeah, I got a five-minute presentation. And they're like, no. And they, like, get super scared for me. And I'm like, what do I do? I could not do that. I'm like, you could do it. You're just not, like, prepared. Or, like, yeah. So... I'm happy where I am. I think it's a cooler um, skill to have to be able to like get up in front of people and be able to talk and not like feel crazy nervous. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of selfish too because I'm being the center of attention is nice, but like if I could do it and be comfortable, that's cool with me. That's why I mean, like I said, I turned to communications better, which is an easier avenue of business. It's clearly hard. It's clearly hard. Uh, apparently, they, I did not learn very much Spanish back in high school, oh but I did learn. I'm so fucking bad at Spanish. It took like two and a half years of it. I think I got a D literally every two years in a row. I got a D. It's like one semester I got a B. And I got a D in college as well. Like, probably my worst class. Spanish but anyway, isn't your uh, forte? No, I'm so awful at it. I'm in the class with a girl that is a Spanish major. And the one class that I'm in with her is the only English speaking class that she has. Wow. And she like, doesn't even know how to act. She's like, this is the best thing ever. I don't ask questions, but that's got to be wild. Just being out of your comfort zone that much. I mean, I say I couldn't do it, but I'm glad that she does it because I think that's just more experience for her. International it's business, awesome. probably. Mm-hmm. That would be cool to be able to cross over borders. But no, what I, the one thing I did learn from my one of my high school Spanish teachers is that one of them was a huge stone, which I always thought was funny, but the other one was like a crazy dude. He could get a ride on a skateboard with like on his hands like holding a teacher yeah he do the splits but anyway this guy he taught me that the number one fear apparently based on some poll they did a few years ago was public speaking number two was death no fucking shit that's crazy i understand dude public speaking is it is like even for me like i am being a communication maker getting up in front of people and speaking you don't want to sound dumb you don't want to do this and that's why you got to take the avenues around it okay Half the people aren't even going to listen to me because they don't give a shit what I'm talking about. Everyone else in the class has to do it. And, like, you just got to kind of tell yourself, if 
things to get around it. And that's I told myself those two exact same things. Yeah, you got to. Because I think about it, I don't listen to a fucking word anybody else says. But then I freak out about my part. Yes. And I'm sure everybody's that way. Yeah, that's why if any of my buddies ever have to give a presentation, I'm good enough to give advice on how they can like, calm themselves down. And they take it. For sure, that's good. Anyways, we should get into some other stuff. So, remember at Cully's when we were playing beer pong? Yeah, absolutely. And we both bonded on trippy drugs. Okay. That's what we are talking about. So the whole DMT aspect, I'd like to try to dive with that a little bit, just because I want to pick your brain about it. Have you done DMT? My one rule in this podcast is not to talk about personal drug use, but a part of me wants to be honest right now. And I, a part of me doesn't want to care because it's like my favorite topic to talk about off camera. So I mean, it's you don't have to post anything, and you don't have to talk about anything at all. Uh-huh. Because I don't know. That, like I said, it's my first time, and I'm just saying like that's originally when you asked me to be. Dude, let's podcast. talk about it. Honestly, I'm talk- happy with what I've done up to this point. It's right. like episode 140. I've never talked about it before, right. and this is very like we can be catching th- me off guard. But I'm so down. We can be theoretical. Let's talk. Okay, we, we yeah we talked theoretical, Let's do that. but my answer to that is yes. But anyway, we'll continue on. All right. <laughs> well, then it's okay. <laughs> 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 I, 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 anyways, DMT. So I learned about DMT through podcasts with Joe Rogan, and he's a DMT guy. I don't know if you don't watch Joe Rogan, you don't know shit about DMT. No. Yeah. He's you gonna pull it up a little bit closer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so if you were to have an experience on DMT, what has it taught you? It's, and how it's, it tell you anything? It's the most esoteric, abstract thing you can ever imagine. It, it's beyond imagination, honestly. Why it's, do you say beyond imagination? Is it because of what you see or what you feel? Both. It's it's a very fractal experience. Yeah. Um, very meaning like geometric. Um, a, a very very the the thing that I find most interesting that I feel is a sense of presence and a lack of. Like a like self dissolution, like almost right. complete to the point that your ego, your sense of self, who the fuck you think you are, everything you think you know about this reality, mm-hmm. starts to just like that rapid fire questions about this sense of and reality. And I think that across the board with psychedelic drugs, I've done shrooms in my life and I've done acid. I mean, that's the thing that, that it, it dissolves your ego, which I think is such a powerful thing. Because every person has an ego, no matter how happy, outgoing, people friendly you are, you have an ego of some sort. You think about your, your, yourself in some sort of way. And without an ego, it's awesome because you can connect with people on levels that you've never thought possible. And that's why I think dabbling in psychedelics is nice because you get closer to people, you understand what kind of like life's really about, in my perspective. Uh, so I think that's awesome. And I think the next step for me was DMT because I've done this, I've done that. Is just like something I've been told all positive things about. Obviously, it scares me. I'm public speaking, it's scary, but doing it like. It's overwhelming. Right. Overwhelmingly scary because it is so intense. Like, it's so sudden, too. <laughs> it's done. Um, so, it, the whole process you smoke it, mm-hmm. um, and then there's what I've seen is that like you take your first hit, right? And it's like, okay, I'm fucking. And then you take your second hit, and it's like, okay, I'm almost there. And then you take that third hit, and you blast off. Did you get to the blast off phase? No. I can't say with conviction I did, mm-hmm. uh, or that I didn't, but I'm almost certain that I didn't, because I've heard it's one of those things that's like, if you know, you know, and I feel like I didn't know, but I feel like I dabbled into it enough. And I think I even was successful at getting the third hit, because that's like a Terrence McKenna quote. He's like, he always says, like, take the third hit so that you can kind of break through and like see the machine elves or whatever right the but entities. i did that was i played between the lines of breaking through and sobriety and that was the most interesting thing and the most of a learning experience for me is that when i felt this sense of presence that was met by some form i don't know if it, i'd call it an entity it was if it was an entity, it was extremely rudimentary, and it's it's shaping. It was almost like a bathroom sign. So were and you talked to? Like, was I wasn't talked to, no. But you communicated in some sort of way? I communicated in the way that it was almost as if they were going on ice skates, and I actually painted that up there. So see that? 
Yeah, so right here. Yeah, yeah, that right there, that was inspired by the experience. So basically, it was almost as if they were on ice skates and just gliding backwards. So this would be me. This was like like the, the entity or whatever it was. And I'm I'm going in a straight line following, and they're and we're moving the exact same pace, but they're going like side to side, like yeah. moving back, but we're still maintaining the exact same pace, almost as if I'm somehow like on like a ski ski uh, like uh, tied to them on like the back of a ski, and following like a boat or something. Right. And I was going towards something, and intuitively I almost felt like I knew what I was going towards, so whether that be it? breaking through. But it was this was probably the most interesting part is while so on my way there, my ego was like, what are my friends thinking? What time is it? Again, it has to do with this reality, this sense of self, this sense of like who I am and where I am at this point in time and space. Um, but as soon as I started to feel doubt, I remember thinking the thought, maybe I'm not ready. And then it immediately, as soon as I thought that thought, the, I guess I got to tell you about the introduction on like how you're kind of brought up with this. So that the sense of presence is simultaneously met with this, at least for me, and this is a very common response, is met with this sound that sounds almost like it's going around the outside of your head. It sounds like... really interesting it's again it's met with a sense of presence so as soon as I felt that sense of doubt about myself or where I was going that entire feeling just dissipated like that like, like so smart suddenly thing, though. that might have been smart that's your body telling you that you might not be ready and with psychedelics is like if you're not ready you can go in a bad place so subconsciously your body was like do not do that there hey you're not ready for it that could have been the best thing ever if you go to that extent, like people, I think psychedelics, I don't think they're scary because I've done them, but I, I mean, there is stories out there, you can look them up, and there's um, there's threads and everything, like people have bad experiences, and I wonder if that was so powerful, where it's like, you're not ready for this experience, could have been the thing, because yeah, I, I've known people that had really, really bad experiences, but I don't know, that's just, that's a mindset type thing, I absolutely, think, I don't think it's a chemical imbalance or anything, I really think it's a mindset, and with what you're saying is I think that could possibly yeah. possibly and if I if I, I mean I, I wouldn't want to have that experience unless I was fully ready and I thought I was fully right. ready but then I felt that sense of doubt right. but it was fear it was that's what made me I mean that doubt was fear based yeah. which is kind of what's upsetting to me like even to this point in time so are you so even after so let's say your first hit there was still like your nerves were still there like after your first hit, your not mind, until I started experiencing it more because I was trying to I mean there were yeah I guess I guess there were nerves I guess there were nerves the entire time I didn't time, know if like so right new. when you hit it it was like oh all my nerves are away no no the entire time like it you, you know how like a lot of people have the connotation around it to where like you're like standing up and you, you rip it and then you just pass out yeah you like consciously decide like lay back down because you're going to want to shut your eyes because you're going to see more with your eyes closed right. than you could ever possibly imagine with your eyes because open. some people do it with their eyes open I, I tried that and it was interesting it was really weird and everything in the room was really see, bizarre yeah. but like the uh, yeah yeah like the closing your eyes was like you were going to like another realm of existence and it's almost, almost it, which is weird because when you were a little kid did you ever just dig your fist into your eyes and just press into you some crazy shapes is that just, no. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you yeah. Can, literally, if you just keep pressing your eyes and stuff, eventually you can bring any shape you want to into existence. Like, just we can do. Do you like imagining? I don't know. Because you. Why do you have the pressing your eyes though? I don't know. Your eyes. Like, I'm telling you, if we just sat here and did it, we could do it. Because I could, I could just tell. I, I'll, I'll I give younger, it like ten seconds. No, don't do it. Right now. They'll try. Okay. No, I do. I don't. Um, when I was younger, yeah, I would sit there and I, I, my ADHD was so bad. I didn't care. So I would sit there and just start digging my, my hands into my eyes. And it's so dark in there that either, yeah, your imagination comes up or your eyes just create something like it's... Interesting. It's almost like watching the clouds. Right. That's that's interesting. Yeah, okay. So I could do that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Touch your eyes later. Rub your eyes later. Closed. Before going to bed. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a good, wild, good point. Um, yeah, because I'm on the verge. I think that's my next step. I think I'm so contained and content with my life right now that like 
I want to experience that. Because I'm like a person that wants to get like in depth with myself and like I, I just like feeling something out here, like all this materialistic like outside world, like that's cool and all, but I want to know like internally everything. So I think psychedelics are, are like that escape. I mean, looking back at the Indians and stuff and ayahuasca and like the burning bush and everything, like, they were so in touch, like, peyote, all that. I think they were so in touch with the Egyptians. Like, I think so too. I think psychedelics were a massive influence on a lot of ancient civilizations. Yeah. And I also think it's the future. It's the past and the future. It's right. just not it necessarily is, the present. It's getting, um, I guess, socialized in a pretty bad way, though, is what I've been seeing, because uh, ayahuasca, which is DMT, but like the liquid form, and you drink it and whatnot, and what is happening is that there's all these therapeutic places popping up, like in LA and stuff, where you can do it. Takes it and takes away because it's such an ancient and sacred thing that like you want to go to Brazil to do with like people that like have grown up around with it and like it's it's a healing process and like it's just popping up in LA you can do this for four hundred dollars and it's like it's taken away so much so like I said I think psychedelics are getting uh, do you think is there like they're they're detached from nature and that's part yes, of the experience that's, that's, that's being that was, lost yeah that's what's one of the biggest things ever because I was supposed to when I graduate in May I got my mom I don't know how I did I got I'll just tell the story. So, my mom knew I started smoking weed when I was like uh, eighth grade, freshman year of high school. And you know, she was cool with it. Like, my parents were always cool with it. And then I started dabbling with psychedelics like midway through high school, so sophomore year. And then I grew my own, right? So, so I grew my own shrooms, and I had syringes full of spores, which is how you grow your shrooms. And you keep them in the refrigerator so they stay fresh. Anyways, I was gone one day, and my mom went down in the refrigerator in the basement and found spores. These syringes, so these uh -huh. syringes, she's free. Oh, she thought like heroin or something. She thought something crazy. So I get home and she goes, Hey, and I was like, Hey, and I was like, Instantly, like I pick up on cues. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell oh, something. something. She's she, mad about something. She goes, So what's in the basement refrigerator? And I was like, I shit my pants. And I was like, Look, it's not what you think it is. It's not bad at all. Like, I don't feel like discussing with you right now. And that's what I said. I said, I feel uncomfortable, but it's really not bad. Went upstairs in my room. Anyways, it was like 10 o'clock at night. I snuck downstairs. I'm going. She threw me away. I was like, Motherfucker. But I understand. Anyway, so, th so that's when it started. So she kind of knew about these psychedelics stuff because she looked it up on the internet because it had the names on it. Oh. Which was like penis envy and uh, B plus. She's like penis envy. What's right? Is my son gay? No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> and, and so you look them up and it pops up as shrimp. It's like, oh, right. Anyway, so it's it's a. Uh, let's see. It was my junior year, so it was no, it was two years ago. So I think my sophomore year in college, I hear my mom trekking up the steps in my room. She comes up and out of nowhere she goes, Hey, do you like know about any psychedelics? And I was just like, I was like, I think I was gay. Man. It's just like, what? And she goes, like, shrooms or anything? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, do you have any? Dude, I was like, what? Like, threw me in. Just <laughs> that me. is a curveball. So she asked me for shrooms, and I was like, oh, not really right now, but I ended up getting her a few grams, and I let her and her boyfriend at that time. Like, do no this. way. So now it's like, it's like, we have the biggest trust ever, and like, are on the same page with everything. That is fucking it was, cool. It was so weird. Yes, because a lot of people say, like, a lot of people still don't care this one weed around the grounds. I give my mom, like, I give her joints and whatnot and stuff. That's really it's interesting. It's different. It's different, but I'm, I'm into it. She understands. She gets it. Me and her are, like, on the same way. So I respect that. But it was definitely a weird time. That's funny. My roommate's mom's really interested in, in DMT and in you know, psilocybin. Which, by the way, the two are related. They're in the same family, apparently. They, they have yeah, some, something overlapped. It's only one compound that's different. Like if you pull up the, uh, I don't know, the periodic table or whatever, I don't know, like I said, communication. <laughs> it's only one chemical compound that's different from DMT and so it's like one. That's it. That's what, um, so like psilocin is very related to dimethyltryptamine? Dude, it's literally the exact same thing, but there's one compound. So if like you look at it, it's Oh, got, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. it's got this compound's the same as this one, this, 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 and then right up here DMT has one that has a different one. Because you can't just, or there, it's like an inhibitor, I don't know, there's like an inhibitor in some of the DMT that's why you have to smoke and stuff, and you can just eat some of the side of While we're on this topic, what are your thoughts? I think people, I, I hate to say there's like a right and a wrong way to do something about like anything. You know, you could say it like, but I feel like there are philosophies that are superior over others. And I think a very, very, we'll just keep that, that those words going, but a very inferior way of doing it, or just a, a lesser way of doing it, 
is to do it in your college house, cooped up inside for the night. You do it late at night, and I don't know. I just I, that's what I've noticed is a lot of people, and I'm not I'm not bashing on that because I've heard of some people having profound experiences, but I just think that dramatically increases the likelihood that something bad is going to happen. All right. Well, I can. So I've known this room like 16 times. Now. So mm -hmm. those 16 times, there's been major experiences. Right. I've done it outside and yeah, inside. How would you compare the two? I've always gained something from being outside in some form of nature or doing something. Whenever I've been cooped up, I've had fun, but it's been worse. The experience has been worse, it's been more pressing. But when you're outside, you can connect with like, I, I, Mother Nature, the Earth, and you can take something from it. And so, my experience is that anyone that knew that I had introduced it, they're like, no, I want to do inside, like, I'm not going outside, I'm freaked out. I'm like, fuck, I just want you guys to do it, I guess, live with you. It's like, this could be better, but anytime I've ever done it outside in the, in the ocean, unbelievable. There's oh, such incredible. a better connection, and I think that's what it is. I mean, the Indians were doing it inside, they were out there, and like, you just, and, I agree, just I agree with the nature. Things. Yeah, I think, I think everyone should use I don't remember what sprung that thought, but like, that was how I initially started the, the whole process, is like, I, I always did it in nature, and same deal. Like I really, really enjoy what you said there. Like you always gain something. Yes, every single time. That's why I did it's it. always positive. Inside, there was always something negative I could pull away. If I was outside, there it was always positive, where I could go to positive places. Because with shrooms, I think shrooms more control you, right? So if you try to control shrooms, you kind of freak out. But with acid, it was always I could do whatever I wanted, whatever I wanted. If I put myself in a situation, if I want to go inside, I'm gonna trip. If I want to go outside, I'm gonna love it. With shrooms, I needed to just be like outside and let it go. So psychedelics are something that I think everyone should dab on. I really do because it makes you so, so yeah. much more in touch with yourself and people, like your friends, anything. You'll love but, yourself more. You will love other people. I think it made me a better communicator. It made me more empathetic, more understanding of other individuals right. and what they're going through. Also, my more emotionally aware, more self-aware, right. more curious, more curious about the world, more more, more creative, sure. more artistic. Uh, I don't know. More yeah. loving. More loving. Dude, to I think those are the best qualities in your life. Like, what you just said is just such a better quality of living. Like, the being able to connect with someone to the opposite of you. That's just what it is. Like I said, you got a hundred years on this earth. How do you want to spend it? You know, you're hating your life, hating everybody else because they don't like what you like, or do you want to respect other people, like what they like to so like? And I just think it's, it's like one avenue or the other. And I think the people on this side that just accept it. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish. We're so young, so if I can keep this mindset throughout, I think uh, overall I'm going to enjoy it. I think it speeds you up by like five, ten years. I think I really do. I think it puts you a few years in ahead. Of which, I'm not saying I'm not saying if you haven't had the experience, then you're behind. I'm just saying from where I was, I mean, just a few years ago, right. in comparison to where I am now, and that their contribution to that. I, I I really do think it's so, only a few years ahead. That puts me so wisdom. So wisdom is how I look at it. It's wisdom you can't achieve until like what I is like when you're on your deathbed. That's when everything comes into you at once and you're like, okay, these are the points of life that I understood, this is what I did and like just wisdom overall is like a uh, overall understanding of life and what it is and what it is to be about it. With shrooms, you're able to dabble into that a little bit, or like any psychedelic is what I'm saying. So being at such a young age, I feel like I'm achieving wisdom quicker. So you're saying that like you feel older, or would you would you just say? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Older in a certain sense, just because you know more just from a drug, and I think that that is spot on because I think that I can achieve wisdom at a, at a younger age before my death. Because you got to do the work, like you said, it's understanding the world or yeah. yourself or whatever it may be, and it's. It's work. It's work, and sometimes it's really fucking hard, but it's a lot of internal world work, and my thoughts, too, are once you make those neural pathways and kind of figure some things about you yourself. You rewire and, your brain. No, oh, absolutely, in a really positive way, or negative, or negative, but I, I usually, my experience has been very, very, very positive. Always. I, I mean, I've had a few, but a few negative experiences, but never for, like, the whole time. Because I can get myself out of it. I can tell myself positive things enough to be able to get out of it. Some people can't. And, and if you can do that on the that medicine, I like to call it medicine instead of a drug, but if you can do that, talk yourself out of that negative rut, 
while on the medicine that you can do it in real life, like in a sober state of consciousness, for sure. It becomes that much easier. Right. It also it teaches you how to think more objectively and like more open. So that's that's what it really does. It makes you a lot more open minded to new experiences, new people, different cultures. Right. I think that's spot on. I think objectively thinking, optimistically thinking, anything of that where you can. Be on the other wavelengths of other people is what you should go for because causing conflict in anything in life, if anything is negative, conflict, confrontation, it's not fun. It makes you uncomfortable. It just it makes you shut down. So I think, like you said, hopefully everyone in society gets on a, a, the, the same page where we're going to be loving and, and move on to something. But as of right now, with media and everything, it just seems like everything is just bashing and just hateful. So maybe everyone just needs to do a. a Else. I mean, on the micro scale, if a few people do it, then I think they're going to project more positivity into the world. I think so. I mean, not inevitably, but it's like. It's getting legal everywhere. Psilocybin is becoming. Um, uh, it, it's getting used a bunch in tests and data and laboratories and science. Like, they're, in, I don't know in what countries, but yeah, and they're using it to like tr treat depression and everything. It'll I don't up. doubt it. It's so therapeutic. It really is. Like, uh, people that, like, go on, like, trips and go drink ayahuasca and stuff, literally will quit heroin dead in their tracks, will quit smoking dead in their tracks. Like, if you really buy into it and, like, rewire you the neurons in your brain, you can do anything. Like, addiction can beat that up. Like, stuff's nuts, and it's powerful. I mean, back in the day, they knew it was powerful. Uh, there's uh, theories that Moses was walking through the force or whatever, or wherever it was, and then the acacia bush was burning, and the acacia is what you get um, ayahuasca from. Or DMT. Like, or DMT from, and he inhaled that, and that's like what it was, like what he wrote about, and like, it, it's just a theory, but to me, it's like, I, I believe a little bit, just because like, I respect that, I don't know. And that's like the most notorious story, besides maybe parting the seas for, for uh, Moses, not, maybe is he, the burning maybe he bush. Did, but maybe he thought that. Maybe he's just doing DMT. Maybe, yeah, you, you <laughs> don't know. There, there's just, yeah, there's so much stuff. But it goes back to that the ancient civilizations or past civilizations and their contribution to progress and how that how that ties into psychedelics and what right. what impact did psychedelics have? Everyone kind of dabbled in it. Because psychedelics are having a massive impact on our culture now. Yeah. It's inevitable. Yeah. It, they've been going on since what well, I mean, not the start of time, but like. But is it weird? So further back than you and I like, can. Psychedelics like have all these um, impacts on society, but then the society's like die out, you know? What if we're getting to that, like, everything's getting legal now, like, really mm -hmm. and then we're going to create something that, like, we're all going to die out? I don't it know. It seems like it, it repeats itself. And then different perceptions and connotations are going to be put on to psychedelics. Right. They're very interesting. They're very interesting. And I don't think they're, I used to think they were, I was very expressive, very outspoken about them being, like, a one size fits all, like, everybody needs to try them. Right. Then I realized people started to think I was getting weird. And I, I got a lot of judgment yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I was around more of a, a party environment where, like, drinking was more acceptable. And in a way, psychedelics are kind of that's the how it was. It was psychedelics are always a drug that's going to do what's happening. But as we get older, it's like, oh, let's do them and try to figure out stuff. So, yeah. That was always my mentality from the first trip. S I think it was partially yeah. the people I was surrounded with and my interest stemmed from a Twitter tweet back in high school that I saw sure. about uh, Steve Jobs said it was one of the two or three most important things he ever did with his life. And I was like, Steve motherfucking Jobs said that? The guy who created Pixar? The guy who created Apple? I'm like, yo, I gotta look into this. And I watched a documentary like a few months later and And then you look at Joe own. Rogan, which is one of the most level-headed people I think he like, if the point of swears by it's like, yeah, maybe more people should try Let's wrap all this up though and like bring cool. it all full circle if we can. Maybe circle of life. But yeah, I think what I gained mostly about it on the same um, uh, connection with you is that the world, I think it's going to the more, or I don't think it's at a positive place right now, but I hope it does get there within our lifetime because I want, like, I want to raise children and stuff, and I want them to grow up in like a positive place. With media and stuff, it's hard though because I feel like there's so much negativity in what. But with you being optimistic and like positive about it, saying, eh, I think it's going to go that way, I like that mindset. Really. I I definitely think it and I believe it to a degree, but it's also that's what I'd like to think. Mm -hmm. And 
it's it's a very metaphorical truth in the aspect that it's I feel better off in that if I if I do think that right. it's it's blind optimism rooted in ignorance, so it's flawed logic. But I, I but I love it. Right. I love thinking that way. Cause I, and I really I think there are a lot of indicators pointing us in that direction. Yeah. But also I'd probably be the same have the same response if I was back in the sixties and I'm like talking about the hippie revolution and right. talking about MLK and the the backlash to the Vietnam War and like just all these things that our culture specifically was going through. I maybe be the exact type right. of optimist, but ultimately nobody predicts the future. I just like to be optimistic about it, I guess. positive, I mean, you're going to walk through life a lot better, and you do a great job of it, like, for real. Like, I know we knew each other back in the day, and then not at all, and in college, like, you're still the same person. Like, hey, hell yeah. You head on your shoulders, for sure, so, yeah, but this was a good, a good experience. You enjoyed like, this? You enjoyed this it? was one of the coolest things I've done. Hell so yeah, I do, I love hearing that. Just in general, the, uh, the headset, like, speaking of, it's so weird listening to, like, myself. Like, I can't hear my own voice out here, but, like, I can hear that's why I talked with you like beforehand. I always like to talk with people for like five minutes, just get them a little bit acclimated right. because it, it's weird. And I get how weird it is. Like the first podcast I did, I just put them on, like with with headphones. Yeah. I just threw them on. I was over at my buddy's place, and where I'm just laughing because I had done this this exact thing for over a hundred episodes, you know talking about random do? shit. You know what What's that? We need to get seven. Psychedelics right here, <laughs> and just, just dive go into stuff. <laughs> just, just go after it. Just enlighten people on stuff. I like it. Try to get into stuff. That would, that would be something cool. I've heard somebody else has proposed that to me before. I think it was three people. Let's go whoever it was. Possibly. With seven grams split between three people. So I was saying between fun. two, but okay, now so, I know. So a full dose. Well, I mean, yeah, exactly. So an eighth. Sometimes it gets crazy, though. I, I, I've ate uh, an eighth of shrimp at some crazy times. Oh, uh, to be able to, like, speak a lot of that at 2 grams, 2.5, I don't know. It, this is really, this is, I feel like people would use this as exact argument against me, <laughs> but I struggle to speak articul and, like, articulate my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's more... It's not like like whenever you, whenever you tell people that it's like yeah I struggle to speak Dude. like oh it's because it's making me stupider it's like no my theory on it is I think it's almost as if have have you ever like been have you ever like written not as fast as your brain's moving so right. then you're you're while writing it just feels too slow yeah, I feel like my my sure. words are too slow in comparison to my mind. Dude, that's one like like I said, if I have done from sixteen times, yes, that's one hundred percent. So when I can articulate the best, it's right on the slope down. So you're yes, still yes. coming, but on the slope down, you can finally come back in again to your like own thoughts, and you're like, okay, yes, now I can take what I just experienced and put it in with what I already know. Or a microdose. Right, or a microdose. And a lot of people do that, um, and that's when it is. But when you're peaking no chance because it's information overload to a certain extent so it's like you can't even talk because you want to talk about this but then you think of something else but on that come down just slightly that's what it is that's the one actually I, I pulled off a soccer trick I've never done in my entire life except what? this one day that I was at microdose is there a word and I had or it or is it a name the soccer trick uh, it's how would I what describe it <laughs> pretty much I I actually have a video of it but I was I had the ball right here. I drug it back and then flicked it up with the opposite foot. So like with my right, here, I'm, I'm gonna, okay, we'll, we'll try it with my finger. I was gonna try to act it out. So you got you pull it back with your left onto the right, flick it up with the right, bring it back to the left, and then do an around the world, and then yeah, okay. off the around the world, you. jump over with the right foot, and then flick it up while while you're in the air with your right foot, flick it up with the bottom of your left and then continue juggling. Yeah, you're, that, I'm just not... It's like a three-step thing. It sounds good. My biggest thing is like advanced randoing. That's like my go-to now because I tell myself to do that not too long ago. Wait, what okay. do you mean by advanced? So normal rainbow is just between two foot, two feet, right? You just rainbow. Advanced rainbow, you take your one foot, you roll it up the back of whatever heel. So uh -huh. I take my right foot and I roll it up the back of my left heel. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So right when it hits, it's in the air and then you come and you hit it with the back of your right heel. So right foot to left heel and then right heel over your head. So rainbow you're just here over your head. Advance you 
roll the ball off that opposite leg, and whenever you hit your heel, you pop it up. On the sprint, you hit it with your other foot over you. It's, and it's a so if your two feet are here, they're both connected to the ball, like no, the ball's in the so middle? so your foot's back there, and the ball's on this foot. You start your sprint, you kick this ball into this foot, and while you're running on a full sprint, this one will kick the ball up right here, and this one hits it. So the two feet never touch? What? No, two feet never touch. Oh, I gotta see this sometime. That sounds yeah. sick as fuck. Let's feel, let's feel out next week. I'm going on this week. I think, I, I think I'm following what you're, you're saying. You're, that's, dude, right that's when you see, you're gonna be like, oh, okay. And then you're gonna be uh, able to do it because you're already like a technician enough to like, because I, I can around the world, but I can't do half the shit you can do. Like when I've seen your videos and stuff, that's, no chance. Honestly, that's, a, that's what I've noticed is some people are very good at this specific thing and then like I, I, the one thing I've never been able to do is catch it on the back of my head. Shit. You know what I mean? But like that's so easy neck. to some people. You know, <laughs> you got a big neck there. You, how, how can you not? Yeah. Uh, cool, cool. Are you ready? I'm about to wet my pants. Yeah. All right, cool. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Care if I make a Instagram video real quick? No, 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 no. That was the most fun thing I've done in so long. Like, like I, dude, I love doing so, this so much. Like, it's just crazy that like I know somebody that like has this information. Yeah, right. That's oh, I love this. Is like my pride and joy. I told the guys I'm like I'm super down to move in with you guys. But you have to like. Do you want video now? Or you want video? I'll fuck it around. What do you have to say for yourself? Uh, that I just got done my first podcast ever, and it was um, a really good experience, and I couldn't ask for more. Wow, that's just heartwarming. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. What's up, dude? How you doing? Your podcast finished. Yeah, we just finished. Oh, oh my god, it is. How was how was your experience? Oh, it was so dope. Like at first, a little nervous, like anything, but now it was super cool. Nice, dude. I think the coolest part is the headphones, though. Like, it feels legit. It feels legit. Yeah. It's so dope. <laughs> oh, I'm about to it's a good you know. touch. For you got a trash can down here? Kenny, yeah, Kenny did his first one recently. Yeah, not too long ago. We got uh, another one in with uh, Brett as well. Yes. Brett Brett. Honestly, I'm, I'm kind of at the point now to where my week, my sh most of my bullshit is like over, so I'm starting to plan like next week, if that makes sense. I got a piss too.